Um, so how to raise money without asking for it. This is my, this is sort of my bread and butter. This is what I love to do because I don't believe in asking for money. So I just don't do it. I don't ask for money. I, I provide opportunities and I actually don't write this in any of this, any of what you're about to see, but that is what the mindset that I want you. Okay, I told you totally got muted for some reason. I don't know why this like muting thing is going on, but okay, you're good now. Go ahead. No problem. No problem. I know. I know. I mean, you go to all these like raising money conferences and how do you raise money and how do you get capital? And yeah, nobody wants to hear that you, you're not supposed to. So I get it. You can mute me. Anywho, how to raise money without asking for it. Let's get on with this. If I can make this go to the next screen. There we go. Nope. Nope. Ha ha. I got it. So about me, I have an awesome husband named Jason. He's my partner. I have three amazing kids and two bulldogs. I'm also a new homeschool mom. And I know so many moms out there, we all became homeschoolers, but I decided to jump in full force because that's just the type of person that I am. If I'm going to focus on something, I'm going to focus on it with my entire life. I lead with aloha, I live with aloha, and that is my motto. I wake up with aloha, and you can ask me for the PDF later. Um, so I'm general partners on over 800 units in Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Texas, and I have a podcast called Multifamily Live. So how to raise money without asking for it. Be Oscar Wilde, not Eminem. Removing imposter syndrome. Be Yoda, and it's not about the money, and leading with aloha. So first we need a syndicator raising money. Me, Peely, me, badass mom, multifamily syndicator. I'll own it. Eminem, not me, and he's not a syndicator. So what I'm trying to get at with this is be you. Like Oscar Wilde says, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. And this should go through everything you do, especially when it comes to dealing with other people's money. Be yourself. You don't want people giving you, giving you money when you're not presenting yourself truthfully. First starting out, you need to build your brand. You need to be consistent with your message and you need to be authentic. Like I said, just be honest with your talk, with your track. So for instance, like on on Clubhouse, if you're a new syndicator and you've never done it before, don't pretend that you've done it. Don't say that you've done these deals. Don't, don't go in there. And I know right now you're like, what Peely, like, how do I, how do I step in? How do I get into this? Cause at some point we all started. Just be honest with your talk track. Say that you're a homeschool mom. Say that you, you've been with your kids this entire time. Say that you have been in corporate this entire time and you were, you were an engineer or whatever you did, whether, whatever successes that you had previous to jumping into real estate, hang on to those and make that your talk track. And be consistent with that message. Be consistent with the type of person you are. Like I lead with aloha. I lead from the fact that I'm a mom because my entire real estate journey has been around motherhood. I was pregnant when I first got my real estate license. I This is the first year that I haven't either had a small child, my youngest is two, so I guess he's still small, or been pregnant. So I lead with what I know. I know motherhood. So just be authentic, be honest with your track record. Don't try, and I know we all do this, New Year's happens and we're just like, we're gonna be this whole new person, yay! That's great, and I'm all about positivity and optimism, but you have to base that in your reality. Who are you really? And lead with that. So if an investor Googled you, what would your message be? Would they feel certain that you would be an app custodian for money they spend time making? You have to remember this going in. And I know I led this whole conversation with you're not asking for money, but that still has to be on your head, in your mind, because you are becoming a fiduciary. You're becoming someone who needs to be a custodian to their money. And you have to remember that money changes hands quickly. And 
often we don't think or we don't like put ourselves into our investor's shoes and think about the blood and the sweat and the tears that they had to put in to make that money. So whether it is you know, 25,000 to $2 billion that you're handling, that investor deserves your care and deserves your thought. So for starting out, most conversations are going to be with your family and friends. So with that, there's less downside because they already know you. Usually they already know your successes and your failures and everything that you've done before. So that's a good thing, they already know you. But on the other hand, because they know you, there might be more critical questions like, wait a minute, you were a bartender, which I was, and now you're selling millions or buying millions of dollars of real estate and you want me to invest in that. How does that make sense? But that's when you have the talk track, when you talk about your successes, when you talk about how you went for, from a bartender into real estate. And I, I have experience in flipping and wholesaling and I've handled this money in real estate and then going into the talk track of how you're jumping into multifamily. And with this, I think my hardest no, my hardest note came from my father because I, I like talked to him. I told him about what we were doing and how we were doing it and how we were building generational wealth like my grandfather did. And I showed him the investment and he actually, I underwrote it with him, showed him all the numbers and he told me no. And that was based on the fact that he just doesn't invest in money, in family. He doesn't, he just doesn't. He doesn't want the downside to happen or for some reason the money disappears or whatever, he just doesn't do it. So you have to learn to understand, to accept the no, but remember that every no is one step closer to a yes. So I'm gonna try my dad again one day and leave each conversation asking if they know someone who this might be right for, that this type of investment might be right for. And he actually, my dad actually introduced me to the fact that my my uncle does the same thing that I did and I had no idea. So letting go of imposter syndrome. Does, do these pictures make sense to anyone? I didn't think so either. So <laughs> I know I wrote this all down. This is for everyone that wants this deck. If you want it, you can just email me at the end. I'll, I'll just I'll email, email it back to you. So no one wants to be overly enthusiastic and no one wants to be that guy either. Or do I? or don't I? Why do I think I have the authority to be on this stage talking to you? Does Leonardo DiCaprio even know who I am? Am I really a badass? Wait, are you looking at my ass? Maybe I should just end my presentation, pretend I just had internet problems. What if they laugh? What if I fail? Oh my God, did I just say ass? And I know this happens to us all. Before I jumped on, I was just like, oh my goodness, what am I doing? Oh, and I have years of experience and I still have this feeling like I'm not enough. But you have to know this, ladies. You are a badass, badass woman. Know this. I want you to repeat after me. I don't care where you are. Maybe if you're, if you're with your kids, don't do this. But I want you to repeat after me. I am a badass woman. I am a badass woman. You don't need to pretend to be that guy because you are a badass woman. You're not a guy. Don't pretend to be one of the Joe Schmoes that doesn't want to let you into the boys club. You are a badass woman. You can do this. You know who you are and what you can provide. You are educated, you are inspired, you are awesome because you are badass. Know it. And our hero, our investors are the heroes, not us. So as badass as we are, we have to remember that the story is about our investors, not us. Your first conversation is never, ever, 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 ever. I don't care if they ask you a billion questions, turn the conversation around. It's never about you. The primary focus gets back to the basic human needs of survival. They have a problem. They need it solved. They want us to see, to hear and understand them. They want to know that they're being heard. You need to express empathy to their needs and then 
And only then, when you know exactly what they need, then demonstrate your authority on how to help them. So again, remember, we aren't the hero, your investors are. So we are the guides, as in Yoda. I like Star Wars, so I'm gonna use a lot of Star Wars uh, terms right now. And the investor is Luke, who ends up being the hero. So our investors face an issue like Luke searching for something bigger and he finds the guide Yoda, which is us. He makes a plan, save the rebellion by learning to how to use the force. He has a call to action, which is take down the Death Star, which could be taking down your first deal. Helps avoid failure. He uses the force when necessary and then he finds success. He saves the rebellion. I promise you there is a uh, meaning to all this. So you are now Yoda. But if Yoda tries to get you, Luke to find his way, use his force, shoot down the Death Star in the first five minutes of the movie, it would have ended badly. So if I came to you and you here don't know me and I'm just like, I have this great deal. It has an IR of 70, 70%. We have a five, five to seven year exit plan. It has a pool. It's so pretty. Here are pictures, blah, blah, blah. Would you invest in me? Would you, and I'm asking you that question, would you invest in me? Even though the deal might be the best deal that you have ever seen, if I don't lead with what, with how I can help you, it makes no sense. There's no sense in you investing in me because I personally invest in people. Yeah, I invest in the deals and the numbers have to make sense, but I invest in people. So, this is a long game. So our proven model for securing investors, first you have to educate yourself. So yeah, I talked about imposter syndrome, but you do have to invest in your mind and invest, like I said before with Stacy, come to REI USA. If you don't know, if you don't think multifamily syndication is for you, look at flipping, look at wholesale and look at all the things that you can do if you're a beginner investor. If multifamily is where you want to go, then educate yourself in it. Show and prove your brand. And this means showing the best parts of you. Make sure you go on, you're going on Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, and showing the best parts of you, showing your proven success, maybe not in multifamily, but maybe in other ways or with your, with your mentor or with your partners. Like prove that you are the one that they want to invest in because chances are they're going to do their due diligence on you. Be clear on your message. So my message is lead with aloha. When I walk into a room, I want to bring aloha into that room. I want to bring love into that room. I want to be aloha. I want to be a bright light for anyone and everyone in that room that needs me. And that's my message. And then going back to understanding your investor's needs, when you're having that conversation with your investor, their key, their needs are first, not yours. Because what if, what if you have this amazing deal? You know it's amazing. You've underwritten it. You've shown it to your attorneys. You've shown it to banks. And they're just like, oh my goodness, we're salivating. But if you don't know your investors' needs and you're like, look at this, why don't you want to get into this? But maybe, maybe they don't want a five-year hold. Maybe they want a six-month year, a six-month hold. Maybe they want to invest in a flipper. You don't know that until you ask them and really understand their needs. And it's only after you do these steps, then you can help them understand the benefits of investing in multifamily then you can provide the investor presentation or your investor deck. Then you can provide the mock deal. If you don't have a deal, this is what Jason and I did in the beginning when we first started multifamily. We put together our dream deal. This is what the deal that we're, we're gonna take down look like. These are the markets that we're in. This is, these are all the steps that we took to get this deal done. And we had it all down on paper for us to give to investors that we thought might want to invest with us. So all this is done before we actually have a deal in place. So imagine again, 
Luke or Yoda is trying to teach Luke the Force, trying to teach him how to do all that while he's like walking down the, or walking on the Death Star, just staring down the barrel of the Death Star. So it's not gonna end well if you don't do all the steps first. I really like Star Wars, by the way. So when you help others, you all achieve an awesome result. That's why I said at the beginning, I don't raise money. I don't believe in raising capital. It sounds so dry because people worked hard for their money, no matter where they are in life. You're helping others. You're providing an opportunity. It's a mindset shift. It's a, it's a thought process when you go into that conversation. You're not going into the conversation raising money. You're going into the conversation, how can I provide an opportunity? And sometimes you're not the right person. Sometimes that opportunity is saying that, hey, you know what? My opportunity doesn't sound like it might be the right fit for you. Here it is, but maybe try Joe Schmo over here or Jane Doe over here. They might have an investment strategy that might work better for you. So if you prime your investors and understand their needs and position them to be the hero of their own story and gain commitments, you can now understand what type of building you can acquire and build your focus back for the money you need to raise. And then you can shoot down that Death Star. And then you can get in and get the deal done and provide all the opportunities that you can to your investors. So again, if you confuse, you lose. So this is someone, an investor who's asking for money. You're proving who you are, why you invest in, in real estate or in multifamily, how the returns work. It's a great deal. It's all bright and shiny with all the whistles. Give me the money. No, absolutely not. And I, I've been approached that way. I've been like, Peely, people have come up to me and be like, Peely, you have to look at this deal. Do you have investors for it? I'm like, who are you? I know we kind of know each other on Facebook, but um, let's, let's have a discussion. Let's really dive deep in like, cause I want to invest in the person, not the deal. So leading with give me the money or even like having them at mentality, you might get a yes, but I think chances are that you are going to get a no most of the time. So your equation to being valuable, I know it says raising money there, but providing opportunity, be a benefit to others, have a quality investment and handle it effectively. So how do you find these investors and what qualifies an investor? So speak with everyone, speak to what you do. And remember when the focus is on helping others, the judgment goes away, whether it's the judgment from others that you think you're getting or the judgment you have for yourself, it goes away because as you speak to it, as you talk more, as you get more of an audience and as you just get more comfortable in it, you'll feel that all slip away. So how do I find these investors? Well, I'll tell you a story about a really good friend. So I'm gonna make sure I'm good. About a really, really amazing friend and mentor I had back when I used to flip and wholesale. So when Jason and I were first building our business, we had construction company, we had flipping and wholesaling, and then we had large multifamily. We had a lot of balls juggling up in the air and that's a whole nother story but we were in this, this community called Seven Figure Flipping. And it was our first hot seat that we had just taken down our first large multifamily. It was a 94 unit in Kentucky. And we were really excited and we were just like, okay, you know what? We have to, we have to tell these flippers and wholesalers about this because they can go on the same journey as we did. Because we started flipping and wholesaling. Why can't they do the same thing that we did? So we shared our entire journey, shared how we got this deal done, shared the steps that we were taking to reposition the property. And we were super excited. And at the end of this whole, like, I mean, we were both on cloud nine. We had given such a great presentation to like these, these investors that they're, I mean, the net worth of the room must have been like a billion dollars or more. I don't know, but it doesn't matter because they were all good people the lead mentor in that room, this gentleman by the name of uh, Andy McFarlane. 
he raises his hand. He's like, Peely, why didn't I get a phone call? From that moment on, I tell everybody about what I do. Because this was this is my mentor, somebody that I'm supposed to talk to, somebody that I'm supposed to share everything that I do with, basically, especially in real estate. I didn't tell him. And maybe it's because I was afraid of imposter syndrome because it was our first one. Maybe it was, uh, who knows, maybe I just got too busy. But this guy wholesales over 300 houses a year. He has the money and he's like one of the kindest, amazing people that you could ever know. So there was no reason why not to talk to him. But for some reason I didn't. And he was actually really disappointed because he was like, Peely, this is a really great deal. I would have liked to be in this. Can you please tell me about your next one? And he's actually invested in most of our deals minus two. So tell everyone what you do, whether it's your chiropractor, whether it's your dentist, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your, because no matter what, and no matter where they're stationed in life, you always leave the question, leave the conversation with, well, I know you weren't, or maybe they were interested, but do you know of anybody else who might be interested in something like this? So definitely, 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 sorry about that. Definitely lead with that. Definitely like talk to everybody that you come across. I know it might seem uncomfortable, but hey, if you're at your chiropractors and they ask how your day was, try and drive it towards that and they'll get more comfortable as you do it because this is what you do and this is how you raise money especially from those that you don't know those that are not in your sphere you just tell as many people as you can and you're you're just be excited about it if you're not excited about it then you're in the wrong business because you have to lead with excitement you have to lead with this is my passion this is what i want to do because with this i can help others Whew. I, I always get passionate about that story because he was seriously disappointed. And I knew from then on that I needed to tell more people. So let's talk about the other side. <laughs> when it isn't always a no, it just might be a not today. Maybe they weren't ready. Maybe they need more info or they just had a setback in their life or 20 other things that has nothing to do with you or their deal or their mustache. I think my husband added that one. <laughs> I would warrant 50% of the times you get no has nothing to do with you and has probably nothing to do with your deal. The long game is more important than trying to close the deal now. Imagine having those 10 great investors like my mentor back in Seven Figure Flipping. And I actually sourced probably seven amazing investors from that group because I opened my mouth and I told everybody what I was doing. Imagine having 10 of those great investors who fund every single one of your deals. So I'm gonna tell you another story about somebody that had a setback. This is a really good friend of mine and Jason's. He actually wanted to invest $200,000 into one of our deals. And he waited until the very last minute to tell us and because he didn't know until the very last minute, he had a setback in his life. So he told us and he was like, you know, I was afraid to tell you, I was thinking, I thought I was gonna get a handle on it before, before we had to fund. And we were just like, there are two ways we could have handled this. We could have been angry, which I've heard stories about and I don't understand. Or we could be like, you know what, dude, we understand. You use that money to provide a safe net for your family. Don't invest in us if you don't have the money. So we left the door open and when he could, he, he started investing with us. But had we got to angry at him, he wouldn't have invested in our next few deals. So remember to, when you get that no, remember to keep on touching back. Or if an investor pulls out, really, again, you have to really listen to your investor because the, the chances are they have a really good reason for not investing. 
So when you actually have the deal and you've done the legwork by making valuable contributions to others and to others that they find personally meaningful and and the rate, then that means that the raise is already done. When you've already done this legwork, the raise is done because you've already provided the opportunity. You've already told people about what you're doing. You've already started your investor network. So you've laid the foundation. So when you get that deal to put on top the foundation that you've already laid, you've already had the hard conversations, then when you actually do call them and say, you know what, I got this deal. They're gonna be like, oh yeah, we had this discussion. So this is the system that we've used time and time again to basically raise our deals, sometimes within a day. And I think our longest one was a week. Our first one took, I would say a week, maybe two, because it was our first one. But as we start to really have these conversations with the investors, with our friends, with, with really anybody, the raise becomes the opportunity to provide that we can provide becomes easier and easier. So if you got nothing else from today, just remember, lead with aloha badass you are. <laughs> Again, my name is Pili Yarusi. I am a multifamily syndicator out of Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, I hope I was able to provide so much value to you. I'm going to stop my sharing right now. See if it lets me go. There we go. I hope I was able to provide enough information to you to get you on your journey or to maybe make a little mind shift in you if you are already a multifamily syndicator into the thought of providing opportunity rather than simply having a capital raise. I love it. I love it so much. It was awesome. Yay. Hopefully that got everybody kind of inspired. So we, you guys, if you have any questions with her, you know, just all you have to do is either put it in the chat or bring your, turn your video on and you can, we'll unmute you and you can ask a question as well. You know, so about raising anything with raising money. I mean, this is what her expertise is in, right? So uh, if you have any uh, questions, <laughs> let her know. Uh, what, a question of, what are y'all working on right now? Uh, we are actually, uh, okay. So I know I just, I just read a couple of, comments from like Clubhouse and people know me from Clubhouse, which is crazy because I've only been, been on there for a month. Um, ever since we've been on Clubhouse, my mind has exploded open again. This happened once when we were flipping and wholesaling and getting into multifamily. Now our minds have exploded again. We're actually currently looking at deals in Hawaii because we want to syndicate a deal there and I've given myself my, the permission to dream. And I've had this dream about owning property in Hawaii because that's where I'm from, but I never had something to wrap around it. Now that I have all of these years of experience with multifamily syndication and taking down buildings you know, across the US, now I feel like I can go back home and really bring that to fruition. So we're actually looking at a deal that's 1,421 acres. And we're, we're currently underwriting it and seeing if how we can turn that into developments, into farmland, into, there's already a cattle ranch there that's existing. So we're looking at the numbers there. Um, and then we're penciling out a few other deals that might go under contract this week. So I can't actually talk about them yet. Um, but as soon as I do, trust me, you guys will be the first ones to know because it'll be a 506 C. So we will let that out. Oh, I always do this. So I'm trying to be cognizant of when I say things. So when doing from a bird's eye view, when doing a syndication, you can do a couple of different capital raises, but the two that Jason and I have done is 506B or 506C. With a 506B, it's 506B as in buddy. That's how I remember, that's how I remembered it when I, when I first started. 
with a 506B, you can only, you can raise um, with investors who are not accredited, but you, can, you cannot shout it out to the world. You can only keep it in your sphere of influence. I am not an SEC attorney. I am also not an accountant. This is just what we do. So with the 506B, only buddies, only people that you have a previous relationship with. 506C, you can market it, but you can only have accredited investors. So that's the difference between those two. I just thought I'd put that out there since I said the term. Um, awesome, we do have some questions. Perfect. Uh, one of them is, uh, how do you go about reapproaching someone who's turned you down? Um, I don't even think of it as a reapproach because I'd like to keep in contact with people as much as possible. But say, okay, for instance, Andy. Andy turned us down on this last deal, but it was because we adjusted our return structure. The returns were still phenomenal, but instead of doing a 70-30 split, which means 70, 70 would go to the investors and 30 would stay with us and an 8% pref, which means the investors, the limited partners of our deal, the passive investors would get an 8% preferred return. They would get the 8% basically cream of cream that came in first before anything else happened. So they would get paid first. We dropped it to a 60-40 split with a 6% pref. Um, that's just the way me and my partners decided to do it. And Andy had another deal that was provided to him that he decided to go in first. And then he said, if you still are doing, if we still need more capital, come and call me back. He's a really nice guy. So how would I reapproach him? I just call him. I just tell if you had another deal, I think you said, Dave, Dave, if you had another deal, I would just call your investor up and say, I have this other deal. Would you like to look at it? And don't, you know what, I'm doing it. Don't lead with the deal though. Like you should be touching base. You should have an investor list. So I have a massive investor list of people that I just keep in contact. I like go down the list and I like give them random phone calls. Like, and I call up Andy randomly and he knows now that I'm just not, I'm not only just calling him because I have a deal. I'm actually calling him because I want to see what's up in his life because he's rarely on Facebook now. So I'm just like, well, I can't be your Facebook friend because you're not there. So if I need to, I'm going to pick up the phone and call these people, especially those people that you know that you are going to want to work with in the future, especially your high network worth individuals that you know you're going to be touching base with first when you have a deal because they want to know that you care about them and you have to come from that spirit of caring. I hope that makes sense, Dave. When you start, when you start putting your, like your um, funds together, how do you, I mean, how do you come up with how you're going to do your shares? It just really depends on the deal. Um, and plus we have a little bit more experience. So we're able to raise from, we, our investor pool is larger. So we don't, we did a 70, 30 split and some people do 80, 20 splits and an 8% pref or a 10% pref. It just really depends on what the deal looks like. So for instance, when we first started, we did the 70, 30 split with an 8% pref because that is how our mentor happened to do it. So we're like, well, it worked for him. So once this last deal was our 10th deal and we're like, well, why don't we try it? Why don't we try the 60, 40? And it's not, it's not because we wanted to keep more. It's because the deal made sense that way. Our investors were still getting their really good returns, actually returns that matched our previous investments. So we were able to do that. And plus we could bring more, more of us to the game and, our, and my partners were just amazing in this. So that's kind of how we did it. It really just I think really it comes with dealing your partners. Too. Oh, sorry. I yeah. think it comes with experience too. Like you did, so you're like, I'll do 70, 30 with 8%. And then after your 10th deal, you're like 60, 40 with 6%. Let's do that. Yeah. And <laughs> it's have so it. many investors now, right? Well, because it also, and I want to speak to this because it also comes now, imposter syndrome comes in again, because now you start to think to yourself, well, am I really worth that? Maybe I'll just give them 70-30 because yeah. that's what I've done before and that's what they expect. 
That's me. You're worth it. If you have done the legwork, if you have educated yourself, if your deal's good and you're providing, leading with the providing of the opportunity, then your investors know that you're, you're a prime custodian for their money. And they're going to want to give you their money for that kind of returns. And that's just, the thing is, like when we underwrite, we underwrite conservatively. But like the deal that we just exited, we had, uh, I think we stated that it was going to be like a ROI of like third, of uh, 15%, 15 something. And it ended up being an ROI of 32%, a return on investment. That's awesome. 32%. Mm -hmm. So we have, we also have the proven track record that we can do it and our system works. Do you raise money? Like, cause we're in the process of doing a fund where we're raising it as kind of like a line of credit. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Or do, like in multifamily, is it usually just per like deal is kind of how it is. Cause in so the self honestly, storage world, it's like, let me just raise some money so I can get out there and buy some deals. Honestly, we're just looking into funds. I'm just starting okay. to learn about those. I am very much. And again, I'm going to, lead with what I know and who I am. Okay. I'm a very much a, I have to focus on one thing and one thing only. Yeah. Like when we, when we got into large multifamily, I learned about 506 Bs and I was like, this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to stick to it. Then our partners on this last deal was like, well, why don't we do a 506 C? Cause then we can just blast it out to the universe. Yeah. And I was just like, Oh, I don't, yeah. yeah. don't know if I can do that. I don't know. And now they were just like, it, it'll be fine. Pili, just here's all the things you need to read. And what's I already knew about, about that. It was just, it was, it was, it, was, it, had, what, it hadn't been what we did before. Yeah. Okay. So I couldn't speak to it. So I had to really dig in and learn about it. I mean, it's basically the same thing, just different structures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, and I actually said no to a partnership with a really good friend of mine, actually a couple of friends of mine who were doing a fund to fund, which is kind of, I think what you're sort of talking about, you're creating a fund yeah. and you're just gonna it's find like deals. So I'm just learning about that, but I said no, because I couldn't speak to my investors with coming from like a place of education, from a place of background, from a place that I've done this before. Yeah. Um, and they were, they, they were raising everything within like two weeks to a month. So I was just like, there's no, no, I can't, I can't talk to something that I don't feel comfortable in. I have to feel very comfortable in what I'm talking about when it comes to my investors. Cause again, I am providing an opportunity to them. I'm not just taking their money and running into this deal. I want to know what I'm getting into. And, you know, also at the time we were just diving into COVID, it was like March and I was like, no, no, I don't have the time to do that either. So it just really depends on where you are in your life, what you need to do and how the deal is structured best. So we are learning more about fund to funds and we might try that on our next deal. And I think, I think private money, everybody's always like, how do I raise money? It's really a mindset thing. It's really just mindset. like exactly what you said. It's really just mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big affirmation person. And I always say like, I'm a money magnet. You know, and like, yes. like over the course of 10 years of telling that to myself, I really truly believe that I'm like, I'm a money magnet, you know, whether or not it's true. I'm like, I'm going to find, I'm going to find the money somehow, but I think it's a mindset thing is really what it is, which I think it no, explaining. it definitely is. And, um, Joanna Wright asked 70 goes through two and the 30% goes to, so in this split, the 70% would go to the, uh, uh, the limited partners and the 30% would go to the general. Yes. Um, Christy says, it's true. I'm a money, money magnet. Kind of see. <laughs> That's a good mindset. Okay, good. Uh, good. What else? What other type of money questions do you have? This is all about money is what this is about. Who has money you know questions? Somebody just asked for my email. I'm going to type that in. And somebody was asking about like, I guess you have some sort of PDF or something. Yep. I don't know if I missed that. What are the instructions for the PDF again? Oh, the Aloha PDF. Yes. Okay. Actually, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? The Aloha PDF. I cannot remember the website off the top, but what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys access. 
because the Aloha PDF is attached to a book that Jason and I just wrote. Um, but I'm going to do this instead because this is absolutely free. Um, this is something I just created. These are multifamily flashcards that you can print out. You can fold them up and then you can learn terms. Like what is IRR, internal rate of return? What is ROI? What is all these things that, especially if you jump into places like Clubhouse or into like big meetings or you start talking to other multifamily syndicators, they'll start throwing out these terms. Like if you're in a flipping a wholesaling business, somebody tells you to underwrite something, you're just like, wait, what? I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the mortgage industry. No, underwriting is the, also the multifamily term for analyzing a property. I remember when I first learned that, I was just like, why are they, why are they switching that up on me now? Why? Yeah. But that's just, a, that's just the way it is. Um, so I'm going to, let me write down. That's, that's that. what I tell all my students too in the self-storage world. I'm like, you've got to learn, like, if you really want to get into self-storage multifamily, you got to learn the lingo, right? Because that's how they talk. They just, in the commercial world, that's just kind of how everybody talks. It's like, oh, what's your yield going to be on that? You know, what do you, what yield are you shooting for? You know, or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. You just have to, you have to know these terms to kind of like, to talk the talk. I mean, you're not, you're not doing the whole fake it to make it thing, but you definitely, this is just the way you're educating yourself. So it's www. Oh, nope. I think I only sent it to. You can tell it to me and I'll put it in. What is it? Yeah. No, somebody direct messaged me and it was stuck on that. So. Okay. While you post that go. out, somebody's asking, what are you rec what are your recommended sources or methods of due diligence research on the syndicator from a passive investor perspective? I can definitely talk on that. So talk to people that know them. Like I'm a, I'm a syndicator. You don't know me. Uh, what I would say is go take a look at my website just to get that overview. Schedule a call with me. And I can put down, uh, I can actually put that down for you. I have a Calendly link that you can have a passive investing call with me and I can get to know you. Uh, really get to know the person, go into Facebook and research them, go into Google and research them, talk to other people that have worked with them. Uh, like for instance, if you started to work with me and you're just like, well, can I take a look at some of your other deals? I'd be like, sure. Here is access to my investor portal. You can look at every single deal that I am currently the asset manager on. So that is some of the ways that I would look to a syndicator that I wanna invest my money in. I would just make sure that I had all the information that I needed on them, their track record. Uh, and see, the thing is like, there are, the new, there are newer syndicators out there. I was a new syndicator at 1.2. So if there's somebody who's new that's coming to you, don't discredit them right out the bat. If they're new and they're honest with you that they're new, that's key. Ask them about their partners. Ask them who their mentor was. Can we talk to them? Can we, can you, I mean, again, because there's so many people that want to get into this. Don't discredit the new people because the good new people partner up with people that have already done many deals. I hope that answered your question. I think that was. I think a good question too is like when at one pool, at what point should somebody say, okay, I'm ready to syndicate? At one, sorry, I'm reading a note from Mandy McAllister. Okay. Uh, at one point, at what point am I, should I be syndicating? A couple of deals. How much experience do you need? Or do you need like, and multi, I guess in bigger multifamily, of course, everything is syndicated, but in the smaller, it's not, you know? So, so at one point, syndicated? should you start syndicating? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. It really depends on the type of deal. I mean, you can, the, the word syndication is just basically you're pooling money. You're pooling money together to buy something but you're taking funds from a lot of people putting it together. So that's like bird's eye view, easy peasy. Um, so you can really syndicate anything, but the thing is the reason why you wanna use syndication for large multifamily is because of the economies of scale. So if I had, let's use simple math. If I had a million dollars, I could use that million dollars for a down payment. 
if I had 10 people, 100 people that all had a million dollars, again, I'm using easy math, then I could use all those people's money to buy a larger building and thus benefit from those economies of scale. And to sort of dive a little bit into economies of scale, what that means, imagine if you owned a duplex. And I started with two duplexes in Indiana when I lived in New Jersey and they actually cash flowed really well. But then at one point, one unit in both of the duplexes were vacant. So that is 50% of my cash flow gone until they could turn the unit and bring in new tenants. So say I have a hundred unit building and two tenants or two, two uh, units are vacant. I still have 98% of that building still rented out and still providing cash flow to me and my investors. So I hope that makes sense. Um, that is why you would get into syndication. It's basically, it's the way to up level yourself into the next arena. So that's why you hear so many people starting off with flipping with wholesaling, which I love and I adored being in that space, but it was a job and, I, and I'm a mom. I didn't need another job. And not saying that, syn that multifamily syndication and asset management is not a job, it is a job, but it's one that I could embrace more fully because it's more of a people person job, if that makes sense. You have to leverage people. You have to have good property management. You have to be a great asset manager. If you are an asset manager or your partner needs to be a good asset manager, your partners need to be in it to win it. If, if one of your partners says that they are going to raise the capital for, or, you know, provide opportunity, but raise the capital for the entire raise and they don't, that partner needs to know that the other partners can come in and help raise. You need to be very cognizant about how you're starting off. I mean, there's so many different things that comes into it that I'm, I'm, I'm basically, I like, I could, I could run into everything that comes and is involved with it, but I, like we would be here forever. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered the question. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. Anybody have any other questions about raising money? Okay, Tiffany says, is the goal to get out within a five year period for investors sake? Is there ever a case where you hold a longer time period? Tiffany, that's a great question. So we underwrite, um, depending on the deal anywhere from five to 10 years, the last deal that we the deal that we just exited, we it was a three year hold because we ended up turning and repositioning the building quickly, but leaving enough meat on the bone that buyers actually approached our broker and asked if we were ever going to put that on the market. So we ended up did, we ended up putting that on the market. Um, so the reason why we do a five year to 10 year hold is because we don't know what the market's going to, what, what's going to happen with the market. So we want to have the numbers for, okay, so year one to three, this is what we want it to look like. Year five, this is what we want it to look like. And if we need to, we can hold it until year 10. And then we'll have, the, we'll have the exit at that point. But it just really depends on what happens. It depends on the deal. And then it depends on what happens with the market. So it's not really for the investor's sake. It's, sorry, I'm reading something. It depends on the deal and depends on the market at the time. And Ronnell, thank you for letting me know that. I'm gonna go fix this, uh, fix that as soon as we're done here. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna leave my web, my, uh, my website. And the website actually has the webinar that we put together for the acquisition, the reposition, and the uh, exit of our 94 unit that we did in uh, January, 2020. I really want to leave you guys with something, but for some reason, the other website isn't working. Okay, uh, so Mandy says, in terms of growing your investor base, what are a couple of tactics you do to increase your number of passive investors? Okay, Mandy, and you are awesome, Mandy. Mandy McAllister is a good question. friend of mine. 
How are you finding your investors? <laughs> so in terms of growing your investor base, what are a couple of tactics you do to increase your number of passive investors? Ooh, Mandy, you want me to share all my, all my secrets. Honestly, like I said, I just talk and I talk a lot, especially now that now that Clubhouse is open. I, I have actually Clubhouse times time blocked into my schedule that I know that either we're opening up a room or we are, I'm going to jump into somebody else's room that I know and that I can provide value to. So if you're not already on Clubhouse and I would suggest you get on because there I've been able to talk and expand my network so much, but and I know I'm kind of giving you a roundabout way that you okay, Pee Wee said just to talk to everyone, but it's true because you don't know who has the money, who needs, who needs the opportunity that you have or that you're going to have. So have those discussions, like ask people, oh, you know, as you get to know them, if, if that, if what I'm doing isn't good for you, do you know of anybody else that it might be for? So really it comes down to just opening up your mouth and being passionate about what you're doing and how you're helping people, especially if you could tie it into something that you want to do to help more people. Like it's all like, it's all tied together and it's just being passionate and leading with that passion. Mandy, I think, I hope that, I hope that answered your, uh, your question. And also just so everybody knows, like, if you don't know what Clubhouse is, um, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a, it's a community of investors that essentially are like investors or want to be investors. Actually, it's, what is it? I guess it's like a pod, it's like a, a podcast. What is it? it okay. So the best way I can describe Clubhouse is it's basically that it's a club and you, you put together your club by the people that you follow. So like my, they call it the hallway is filled with real estate investment. So I can go in there and I can see who's talking about real estate. And I could see, like, I just, I hopped into a room. I want to, uh, I'm, I'm also following like a lot of podcasters. So I hopped into a room with uh, John Lee Dumas the other night. And he's an excellent podcaster. I had him on my podcast a couple of years ago now. But, you know, I got to talk with him. I got to ask him a question. Same goes like I've met so many different people that I didn't know existed in the multifamily realm that have opened my mind up to development, to lie tech, to, to so many different avenues of real estate that I wouldn't have gone in on my own. You guys kind of know me. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to kind of stay in my lane until somebody tells me that there's a way I can shift and they'll shift it a little bit. So it's like, it's like a place that you can go to share value and ask questions. I know, I remember when it first started getting, I mean, there's really only about 2 million people there right now. I mean, considering that's still relatively small and it's only on iPhone but I've had such powerful conversations there. It's, it's gonna be one of my like places to go to like talk to people. I think that's the best I can describe Clubhouse. I've met so many amazing places there. And but yeah, yeah um, so, and then also just so everybody knows, Tuesday nights, uh, REI USA has a room. All right. <laughs> so if you want, if you want to hang out on Clubhouse, then essentially look, Tuesday nights at at six thirty, from six thirty to eight thirty, something like this. We're having a room every Tuesday night, and you can come on. So make sure you look up Real Estate Talk. That's where we're going to have our room. And then all the teachers of REI USA, anyone that wants to come hang out, we're all going to be just talking there as well too. So I'll be there. I have a room at two thirty Central Time, so that would be three thirty. And I only, I only hold the, my rooms open for like an hour and a half. I don't do the marathon rooms because I have yeah. kids. Yeah, no, we're not doing the marathon rooms. No. I, got a, I got family. Yes, yes. <laughs> Some people want to do that. I know that's not our thing. Like we just do like hour and a half. That's good. An hour and a half is yeah. a good amount of time. I that think. is a good amount of time. Yeah. Okay, good. Did we have any other final questions? What is Sasha saying? On Facebook live event, Microsoft. They're talking about Clubhouse. Podcast. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so definitely check out uh, check out um, 
I think check out uh, Clubhouse as well. We'll be there Tuesday night. So you can hang out with us and just talk. Talk real estate. Anything else? Any other final thoughts or anything that you want to bring up before I bring the next one up? Just be a badass. Like the title of this is, you know it, own it. So join and be in REI USA, figure out what avenue of real estate you want to do. And if you want to get into multifamily, hit me up. Let's have a conversation. Yes, exactly. I love it. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for hanging out with us and like sharing your wisdom. And um, I'm sure a lot of people will follow you and, um, and then hopefully we'll get some, you get some deals done. <laughs>